one of the virtues I think of your scenario is that it doesn't require quantum mechanics uh, to be reconciled with gravity. And I always say that until you hand me a letter from God and it says you have to marry, quant- there has to be a quantum description of, of relativity with uh, that's commensurate with all of our other classical and quantum theories of electromagnetism and quantum, uh, quantum electrodynamics. Um, the only two regions where it seems to be relevant are near singularities, which are unobservable. So we have this kind of uh, Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail, that we need quantum gravity to explain singularities, but singularities only exist in regions that are uh, in practice and in principle unobservable. So I wonder if you can take the other side, Julian. Do you think, you know, argue against your position, uh, in other words, a, a steel man, what do you think are the best arguments that we need, a, that we have to have a theory of quantum gravity? Do you think it's, uh, there are arguments to be made that support the necessity of a quantum theory of gravity, or is it just kind of part of the appeal that human beings have to make everything classical quantum? What I feel definitely is we have to have a quantum theory of the whole universe, the facts of quantum mechanics around us. I mean, you and I couldn't be talking like this if it weren't for quantum mechanics. <laughs> That's yes, absolutely clear. Yeah. What, I, what I do, I mean, everybody thinks, uh, I think virtually everybody in the field thinks that the problems of quantum gravity are at their most extreme at the Big Bang and also in, in black holes. And for a long time now, my collaborators and I have been saying, no, the quantum theory of the universe will take its simplest form at the Big Bang because there its shape is at its most uniform. And the quantum issues will become interesting later on. And we know they're, we know they're damnably interesting now. And they seem to be interesting in black holes. The evidence from black holes is that, that, that they're interesting by, by, by then. I mean, with the hawk of, work of Bekenstein and Hawking. Um, so that's how I would put it. We're looking to turn this upside down. There's an interesting thing I know uh, uh, Carlo are very, very, very well, and I've also talked quite often with Abbe Ashtakar. And mm-hmm. me- quite a number of years ago, this might be twenty years ago or more, I said to them, "Do you think quantum gravity will require a first of all to be in the first place a quantum theory of the whole universe, or only of a part of it?" And both Abe and Carlo unhesitatingly said, no, we can start with quantum gravity in in a part of the universe. We don't have to have a quantum theory of the whole universe. Now, with my Machian uh, convictions that you have to talk about the whole universe, uh, I I disagreed on that one there. So that that would be where I would disagree with with Carlo and um, uh, Abe. Mm. Um, I think Lee has more sympathy. Uh, Lee is, of those three founders of loop quantum gravity, Lee is closer to my position, I think, than the other two. Yeah, I agree. I think the thing that you know perplexes people and is sometimes used by proponents of intelligent design and and proponent religious uh, you know practitioners is is to use this board uh, Guth Lincoln theorem. Um, and uh, and use it to basically motivate a beginning, which would then you know be in harmony with the Torah or Old Testament uh, description in Genesis one one. Interestingly enough, that Fred Hoyle uh, used to criticize cosmologists who supported the Big Bang as being overly concerned with Genesis, which I think is laughable nowadays. People don't uh, associate cosmologists with being fervent Bible beaters, but nevertheless, uh, people do use this theorem. And Vilenkin himself says things that the uh, he doesn't actually believe it leads to a singularity, but he does say that this uh, the entropy, uh, according to the behavior of entropy in the observable part of the universe, is many orders of magnitude lower than its maximum state. And the second law of thermodynamics says that the initial entropy of our co-moving region on this boundary, not the singularity, but the eventual boundary that all space-time geodesics terminate on, going backwards... Uh, must be lower still. So the universe must have originated in a very special, non-random state of extremely low entropy. In your mind, I mean, what is uh, what is the lacuna, the gap, the the the, the problem with with Lenkin's claim and that necessitates a new interpretation of time itself? In other words, armed with GR, armed with an expanding space time, you don't even need to say it's inflation. Although obviously, Lenkin and Guth are huge supporters of that. Uh, but nevertheless, if you just have an expanding space time, you'll go back to some point 
in the past, uh, and you'll achieve lower and lower entropy. And the question, of course, is that, uh, you know, who, who ordered it to be zero in the beginning, but that's, that's, you know, uh, so I guess I'm asking, what are the, what are the failings of that theorem, the singularity theorem, which is a misnomer of board Guth and Blanken that, that your theory rectifies? Is it, is it that, that it's purely, uh, geometric, it's scale free, it's gauge invariant. Is it that it's more an interpretation, uh, a, a, a difference rather than an actual physical prediction? Obviously, they would predict inflationary gravitational waves uh, because they support inflation, but you believe inflation is not necessarily mandatory. So, what are the virtues of, of the approach that you've taken over there as succinctly as possible? I, I come back again. I'm, I'm going to get a verging on on religious now. It's okay. We've had on rabbis uh, I, and and Christian scientists. <laughs> I am very very struck by this idea that the universe does have a beginning, but it's but it's a very uniform beginning, mm-hmm. and out of that then structure grows. Now I recently checked out the etymology of the word creation. Do you know what it is as a matter of interest? Creation, the word in, in Latin or? Yeah, where, 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 what is the etymology of creation? Well, I'll... I'll is it to emerge from or something like that? You're quite close. It actually comes from an Indo-Germanic word, which means to grow. Ah. It's nothing to, to me, it's not creatio ex nihilo, it's to grow. Mm. Now, if you think about my idea that the universe starts very uniform, it's like a flat field with soil, just a little bit of variety in the soil. And then out of that, the grass and the bushes and the trees grow. And the quantity that measures that growth is, I come back to this extraordinary, in the Newtonian theory, in the, in the point particle model, the quantity that measures that is this complexity. It does everything at once. It's the size of the universe. It's the intrinsic size of the universe measured by rods within it. It's the, it's the potential energy made scale invariant. I think there's a very good chance it's got it, that it's time. So, so in fact, I would say time is creation. Because the amount of creation is literally the time. It's the potential energy made scale invariant. It is really actually rather, if I may say so, an attractive theory. It'll be a pity if it's wrong. 